the 10th Bike Story Night here at Eastside Pedal Pushers. Yay! Thank you for coming. Forgive me, I'm gonna go ahead and sit down. This is like my opportunity. Um, my name's Valerie. If I haven't met you, it's so good to meet you. I'd love to chat with you during intermission. Please let me know how you heard about this. Feel free to send me messages or anything like that. Um, I'm gonna try not to talk too fast, but I always think about the run of show. We have a full show here tonight. We've got six storytellers. I'm super excited. We have so many great raffle prizes as well. We have Lee, who owns the bike shop, who's also going to come up. Um, we've got wild cards. Um, if you don't know what wild cards are, those are last minute story submissions, essentially. Unfortunately, um, since it's last minute, you don't get to show your photos like a featured storyteller, but you still get to share your story. Um, you have about half the time as featured storytellers. Um, do, but you can submit as a wild card if you've been thinking about sharing a story, a bike story. Um, the forms for that are at the check-in table with Cinda and me. I'll be back over there as well. Um, we also have community plugs at the end. This is one of my favorite parts of the night, so don't leave. <laughs> Stay towards the end. Uh, if we give you anyone here who wants to talk about anything that they're excited about and want to share with the bike community, it doesn't have to be bike-related, um, to come up for 30 seconds and give your spiel. You know, it could be, hey, I make cupcakes. Hey, go, you know, to this cool bike event next week. Hey, go um, bike ride with me. I don't know, whatever you want. <laughs> uh, but you have 30 seconds. Um, raffle prizes. Thanks so much to all of the folks who donated. Sorry, Jordan's telling something. We also have an amazing nonprofit who is coming on first um, after Lee. Uh, and we have an introducer for every storyteller and for the nonprofit. From, we have a different um, person from the community who graciously comes up and introduces um, these fine storytellers who are going to share with you tonight. Um, so give it up for them and all of the storytellers and Lee and all of the sponsors and partners and raffle prize folks and you for making it all the way down here on a Wednesday night when it's kind of warm out. You rode your bike here probably. Shout out to also Maggie, by the way, who's a storyteller tonight and led the ride. Thank you, Maggie. I'm so happy to be here, y'all. Thank you so much for coming. Um, Shout out to Valerie. <laughs> That is my spiel. Again, reach out with any questions in the future, but I'm gonna let the show get started. Um, again, it's a little bit light out, so photos won't be shown, um, fortunately, until a little bit later. So stay tuned for photos and a story um, once the sun goes down. Apologies to Hill Country Ride for AIDS because they're first, um, but we're gonna show their photos during one of the later storytellers who has kind of a tie-in with the um, nonprofit. Uh, but with that said, let's hand the mic over to the one, the only, Lee Grisham. The one, the only, thank you for that nice introduction. And thank everybody for coming here to Eastside Pedal Pushers for Bike Story Night. Um, I don't particularly have a, a linear story for this evening. Um, and so my, my thing is going to be pretty short. Um, mostly I wanted to talk about how bicycling has influenced me in one particular way. And it has to do with the tour, the first bike tour that I took in 1995. Um, so yeah, kind of old. Anyhow, um, I went from Austin up to Ontario and became really good friends with a couple named uh, Rick and Katie. They own a very small bike shop in a town called Bloomfield, Ontario. It's right on the lake. And I started going on mountain bike rides with them. Their shop is more focused on, on mountain bikes and uh, you know, every, gosh, I think it was Tuesday nights, they had a shop ride, went through the woods near their place. And I was really impressed that on all the rides, they would point out 
plants that were native to that area. And yeah. <laughs> um, one time we even, or they, um, they got a piece of fungus called a puffball, puffball, and took it home, sliced it up, and sauteed it in butter and garlic, and it was delicious. I had never really considered that uh, up to that point. So when I got back to Austin, two things. I was very excited about bicycles, and that led to me volunteering at the Yellow Bike Project, et cetera, et cetera. Now I have my own shop. But it also instilled in me the notion that I wanted to become familiar with plants that grew around Austin. I grew up in Dallas, been in Austin for a bunch of years, and I realized that I didn't really know much about what grows around here. So by virtue of that tour and meeting those folks and uh, seeing how excited they were about the plants that grew around there, I kind of became pretty excited and wanted to learn more about plants that grow here. And I encourage each of y'all to pay attention to what's around you. Uh, you know, obviously if you're riding your bike on the street, you have to pay attention to the cars, but if maybe you're on the Southern Walnut Creek path, look around. There's, there's quite a bit of, uh, of plant life that maybe you know about and maybe you don't and it's worth checking out. However, let me caution you, <laughs> there's so much poison ivy here, it's amazing. <laughs> Not just here, all along that fence, um, but obviously just in Austin in general. And if you don't know how to identify that, please come talk to me and I'll show you. <laughs> um, thank you. Thanks again for coming. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Hi folks. Hi. Hey. Hi there. Hi. My name is Travis Holler and I have the honor and privilege to introduce uh, our next speaker. Um, I'm going to give a shameless plug for the group that I'm with though in the meantime and give you a little bit of backstory about our next speaker just before she comes up. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, my name is Travis Holler. I'm a co-captain for a team um, for an event called the Hill Country Ride for AIDS. Um, Woo! which uh, just happened two Saturdays ago on uh, Saturday, April 22nd. It starts out of Krause Springs in Spicewood, um, and it's uh, anywhere from 13 miles to 90 miles. We have a variety of different, uh, different courses that different riders uh, of all abilities come out to support nine different um, LGBTQ plus nonprofits in the Central Texas area. Um, Alyssa Magrum, yeah, give it up for that. So our next speaker is Alyssa Magrum. Um, she has a fascinating story to tell about her involvement with Hill Country Ride for AIDS, which just had its 24th year. Um, and a fun fact that I'd like to share is that Alyssa has been involved with the ride pretty much in any, in some form of capacity for the last 24 years. Um, in fact, uh, she'll share a wonderful story with her uh, about her daughter who's about to turn 18 and how um, one of the first gifts she'd ever been given was a medal from one of the rides because uh, she was literally, I think, born during ride weekend. Um, but going back to my involvement real quick, um, I'm a team, team captain for a team called All Ride, All Ride, All Ride. And, oh, yeah. Shake it. Shake it. <laughs> and we ride on behalf of one of the beneficiaries. As I mentioned, there are nine beneficiaries for the Hill Country Ride Parades, and we ride on behalf of Out Youth, which is a tremendous oh, organization, oh, oh. yeah, serving uh, local LGBTQIA plus youth in uh, Austin, but greater Central Texas in general. Um, Alyssa is going to give you a little bit more insights about the ride and her experience. Um, but if anyone has any questions or has any interest, um, we have a tab on the Out Youth website, outyouth.org, um, and you can learn more about our team if anyone wants to get involved for future uh, rides and, and coming forward. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Alyssa Magrum, the ride director for Hill Country Ride Parades. <laughs> Thank you, Travis. And yes, I am wearing flip-flops with socks. I will talk about that later. I will remove them so you don't have the whole camel toe thing going on. Um, okay, well, so thank you, Travis, and I do love that he gave a shameless plug for his team, All Right, All Right, All Right, because I think they won one of the biggest awards for the 
largest teams at the Hill Country Ride for AIDS. And um, I want to thank Valerie for inviting the Hill Country Ride for AIDS to be part of this and inviting me to be part of this. Um, I'm really excited about the person who's following me, Preston Tyree, who, because we worked together years ago on to something totally different. So I love seeing you in the lineup. Um, and I know that you'll hear from Kathasaurus later, who's also part of the Hill Country Ride for AIDS. And um, I had to bring some props because I knew she would have some, and I figured I was going first. I got to do something. Um, so anyway, again, my name is Alyssa Magram. I am and was the acting ride director of the Hill Country Ride for AIDS this year. And as Travis mentioned, it's this was the 24th annual. Um, yeah, pretty awesome. And I will talk about that, but I want to follow the bike story night theme here and talk about my bike story because my bike story actually does weave in into and come out around the Hill Country Ride for AIDS. So who remembers their first bike? Like 100% I had the whole banana seat going on maroon with a yellow gold sparkly like seat streamers and all of that and um, that was my first bike and then I went into like the 10 speed the Huffy 10 speed bike um, and then when I got to college, I had a Hard Rock Ultra mountain bike. It probably weighed 50 pounds. I weigh about 100 pounds, so it was like half my weight. So I rode that bike all around campus. And then in, I am old, by the way, old, old meaning I'm all about all closely, closing in on 50. But um, in 1997, um, I lost a friend to AIDS. And his name was John. And... I have always been involved in charitable things and volunteered and done things like that. It's one of my core beliefs and passions. And when John passed away, I heard about this thing called the DC AIDS ride and I lived in Virginia. And so I took my very heavy mountain bike and I rode my bike from Raleigh, North Carolina to Washington DC. It was four days, 350 miles. That shit was heavy, sorry. But like people were on road bikes and I didn't know what a, really didn't know what a road bike was. I forgot about the Huffy, but. Um, and if people are going so fast and I'm like, gosh, this is hard. And at the end of the ride, you're supposed to like lift your bike above your head. <laughs> okay. I was literally a hazard to all around me. So I'm like lifting that up and I'm falling over. And anyway, I did that ride. And then soon after that, I moved to Texas. I moved to Dallas, spent a year there. That was enough for me. And then I made it here. But when I was there, there was the Texas AIDS ride had started. And so I got involved in that. And then I rode my bike and did the California AIDS ride. And I rode, that was I think seven days from San Francisco to LA, so I did that. I went to Alaska, I did the Alaska AIDS vaccine ride. That was a survival test. There were 1,500 people that started, 150 of us finished. I do feel very proud of that. It became a survival test. It was in August, which is supposedly summer in Alaska. Winter came early, so we had sleet, snow. Most people got on these SAG buses that they brought in like the National Guard to get people to camp. Our method of survival and finishing that ride was do not get in the warming bus. There were these buses and they were, they were warm, so you got in and you never wanted to get out again. Who the hell is gonna get on their bike seat that has a frozen, you know, the saddle is frozen. Who's gonna do that once you've been in the warming bus? So. Our, our thing was don't take a hot shower because they have these hot shower trucks and do not get in the warming bus because if you get in there, you will never get out. So anyway, completed that Alaska AIDS vaccine ride, came back here, um, moved to Austin, and back to the story, Travis was talking about the Hill Country Ride for AIDS, and I will circle back to that. Um, there's nine beneficiaries, and one of them is Waterloo Counseling. So Travis talked about Out Youth, which is where he who he represents, but uh, Waterloo Counseling is another nonprofit. And when I first moved to Austin, I, the very first place I went, because I was going through some stuff, and I went to Waterloo Counseling, and I was a client of Waterloo Counseling, and it's interesting, as I was in this role this year as the ride director, acting ride director for the ride, I realized, wow, I was a client of one of these organizations. Um, okay, so back to the, back to, it's, I think it's 1999, maybe, going back, and I now have a road bike. So I have graduated from the very heavy mountain bike. Thank you, Preston. Yes, very road bike. Nothing fancy. It was actually a Schwinn steel. My grandmother passed away, and I, and she left each grandchild like $1,000. So I bought Mag Magic Alice. Yes, Magic Alice with my $1,000. So I thought I was I had arrived on my road bike. So I get here. I do the all those other rides, and then the Hill Country Ride for AIDS began. 
and I had done all those other rides. And I was like, I have to be involved in this. And my partner at the time, she and I had done all those rides, and we we're like, let's be crew. Let's do something different. Let's not ride. So the very first ride of the Hill Country Ride for AIDS, um, I was crew, which if you've done it, it's like you're sag and sweep, but it's like sag and sweep on steroids. Like we had a blow up doll on the roof, we were screaming and yelling, and it's like not the, if you've done a, a ride, the Hill Country Ride for AIDS is a community of kindness and it has a really special spirit. And the pit stops are parties and it's the sag and sweep vehicles are, have a personality. And so I did that the first year. And then after that, every year, leading up to this year, I was involved in some way, shape, or form. And as Travis mentioned, the year that my daughter was born, which she's about to be 18 on Monday, which is crazy. Um, but that year, I was very large and pregnant, and the ride happened. And so I went and cheered people on at the finish line and at the start line. And then promptly, like six days later, I had her. It was a very difficult birth, emergency C-section, survived. And David Smith, who, if, does anybody know David Smith? Okay, so David Smith was the ride director for years for the Hill Country Ride for AIDS. And he showed up to the hospital, and one of Ella's very first gifts was the finisher's medal for the ride. So um, that, I have a very long history with this, and I need to talk about the, my bike story is super wrapped around AIDS rides and doing, riding my bike for good. Um, I'm a charity athlete. I swim miles and miles and miles. I ran a drowning prevention aid organization for 13 years, and I've swam a lot of miles for drowning prevention. I figured out when you have a passion for what you want to do, you do it, and you do it for good, right? So I, I, I met Trust, uh, Preston because we were organizing a charity mountain bike festival years ago. That was like 2001 or 2002. And we organized that. I mountain biked. I mountain bike raced. I'm like, shit, how do we make mountain bike? There's no mountain bike races for charity. Let's create one. So we worked together on that. So circle back to over the years with, because I know I'm supposed to be the featured charity, so I'm supposed to talk about the Hill Country Ride for AIDS. So keep me, keep me focused, people, because I can talk. Um, but over the years, I have participated in the ride in a lot of different ways, whether it was riding or being on crew or this year I fell literally into the role as the acting ride director. Um, and it really is truly, if you like to ride your bike, who likes to ride their bike? Pretty certain that most of us here like to ride our bikes. If you like to ride your bike and you care about humanity and you wanna be a part of something bigger, like be a part of the Hill Country Ride for AIDS. We just did it, but there's a chance to do it in next year. Um, it really is, we say it's a community of kindness, and if anyone who's participated in it, it really, it really is that. Um, I, I got the honor this year of ending up as the ride director because I left my executive director job of the nonprofit I had been running, and I was a contract worker, and I'm like, what am I gonna do with myself? I, needed, I need something, so I said to some of the ride people, like, do you need help? And they were like, we don't have a ride director. So I started as the development director and I could not stay in my lane because I can raise money. I can raise a lot of money, but I also then was like, well, what about the riders? They're raising pledges. Somebody needs to support the riders. So I became the ride director and that has been the greatest gift of the last five months of my life. And I'm looking at some of the riders and some of the beneficiaries and something that's so beautiful about the Hill Country Ride for AIDS is a lot of, has anyone done a charity ride or something? Like it usually benefits one organization, like the MS-150 or, you know, whatever. The Hill Country Ride benefits nine local beneficiaries. And Travis talked a little bit about that. And I'm not gonna name them all because I'll miss one and then I'll feel horrible. I do have a, a list on my, my uh, thing, my clipboard there, but I'm gonna say go to the Hill, go to the hillcountryride.org and look at the beneficiaries. But the beautiful, one of the most beautiful parts about this ride is that all nine of those beneficiaries show up, they have teams, they work together, they raise money together. We raised over $500,000 this year. <laughs> a lot of, that's half a million dollars, folks, right? And that's people raising pledges like $10, $50, $100, um, and all of that money goes directly to those nine beneficiaries who are providing a continuum of services. So the nine beneficiaries do so many different things. I, that was one of my jobs in figuring out my job was like, what do all these beneficiaries do? Like I had been a client of Waterloo Counseling, so I knew what they did and I have supported, um, oh, I have two minutes. I don't like the two minute warning. That is not fun. Um, okay. so. I challenge you to go, they can, they provide a continuum of services. Everything from 
prevention and education, HIV and AIDS prevention and education, to counseling, to housing, to transportation, to food pantries, to, I'm probably missing hospice. hospice. Thank you. Call it out if you know it. I love crowd participation. But it's beautiful because all of those beneficiaries come together to put on the Hill Country Ride. So there are teams like Travis's All Ride, All Ride, All Ride, and Kathasaurus, what team are you on? Friends of David Ooh, Powell Clinic, yes, Powell. yes. So beneficiaries come together and, and I've worked in nonprofit for 25 years or more. And when you're scrapping for resources to do your services, often there's sometimes collaboration is hard. And that is one thing that the spirit of the Hill Country Ride for AIDS is unbelievable. So I did bring a prop. Okay, first of all, who, who's familiar with Pride Socks? Anyone? Pride Socks? Okay, Rachel Smith from Pride Socks. Shout out, because I think we're streaming live somewhere. So Rachel um, worked with us this year, and the socks that I have on, and Kath Soros has the socks on too, and you're gonna hear from her later. These are on pridesocks.com. They benefit the Hill Country Ride. $5 from every pair, sorry if they're dirty, but um, they're the You Are Loved socks, so I'm gonna challenge you to either like support the Hill Country Ride or go buy a pair of socks or something. Um, but I wanna read you the back of this jersey, and I'm sure I'm, wrap it up. Okay, I'm wrapping it up, I promise. Do you feel bad that you're making me wrap it up? Because I'm not really done yet. Okay. <laughs> All right, so this is called the Wishlist Jersey, and I this jersey is, is was created in 2000. Um, there's a guy named Brian Andreas, and he writes these stories. His website is storypeople.com, and he writes stories. And my um, partner and I sent him our stories of why we do the AIDS rides. And he created this story, and then we created this jersey, and we sold thousands of them over the years to raise money for um, various causes. A lot of them, the Hill Country Ride was one of the beneficiaries. So I'm gonna read it to you, and then I'm gonna close that out. And I'm gonna encourage you to support the Hill Country Ride for AIDS in the future, whether it's show up to ride, show up to volunteer, support one of the beneficiaries, get involved, um, but in some way show up. So I'm gonna close it out with, um, Oh, I do have this really cute picture. I know I'm, I'm done. I'm not looking at the lady with the sign, but um, this is my daughter when she was four, and she was with her bike waiting at the finish line for people to finish from the Hill Country Ride for AIDS. So I could not show that. But I'm going to read you this story, and this is really why my bike story led me to all these AIDS rides and to the Hill Country Ride for AIDS. So, um, okay, it says... I wish you could have been there for the sun and the rain and the long hard hills, for the sound of a thousand conversations scattered along the road, for the people laughing and crying and remembering at the end, but mainly, I wish you could have been there. So that is the wish list story, and that is why the Hill Country Ride exists. We exist to remember those who have been lost to AIDS, those who are living and thriving thanks to the services of the beneficiaries, many of our beneficiaries who are thriving with HIV and AIDS now. And so thank you for allowing me the time and the space and for listening. This is really a beautiful community and I can tell that many of you would be welcomed in, well all of you would be welcomed in, but I think you would love the Hill Country Ride for AIDS in our community of kindness. So thank you and I'm officially wrapping it up. <laughs> Preston Tyree. Um, I've never met the man. 
However, I have quickly learned in the last talk and from some background research that he is an absolute legend. Um, I think a lot of people would spend their whole lives as a cycling advocate, getting people of all ages and abilities on two wheels or three, um, and consider that a life well lived and a lot of things accomplished. And Preston has to go the extra mile for the people who can't ride a bike on their own and get a bike with an extra seat um, so that truly everybody can experience how, how wonderful and delightful it is. Um, so without further ado, everybody give it up for Preston. Good evening. Good evening. Howdy. I love it when people sit up here and talk about being old. <laughs> I've been riding bicycles for 75 years. And I'm not done yet. But I have a story about, as the introduction said, a guy who couldn't ride on his own. I've had the opportunity to ride with blind riders. You can do it too, by the way. The Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired has a program called Lend Your Legs. Yeah, they have tandems and you can ride the front. And somebody who can't see well can ride the back. Well, let me tell you a story about Jimmy Hudson. Jimmy's an interesting guy. He started life as a newspaper reporter, became very involved, and went to Paris, France, and wrote for the New York Herald Tribune in Paris, France. Found the love of his life, got married, came back to the U.S., and started to lose his sight through macular degeneration. I'm not sure you're familiar with that, but it means this is gone, but this maybe is still there. And that's what happened with Jimmy. Jimmy was a big man. He had box semi-pro heavyweight. And I've gained some weight, but I'm not that big. So the reason I talk about Jimmy is because I was reading the Southwest Cycling News. How many remember the Southwest Cycling News? Yeah. Some of the older folks in the neighborhood. Yes, there we go. Uh huh. Southwest Cycling News was the awesome cycling newspaper that went all over the Southwest. And I saw an ad in the in the bottom of the Southwest Cyclist News, and it said, "Blind cyclist as a tandem needs a captain." You remember that, Lee? Yeah. Yeah. And I thought, oh, how hard could that be? You know, I'd never ridden a tandem, but you know, come on. Yeah, we can do that. So I contacted Jimmy. And he said, well, come on over. Let's talk and everything else. So I get over to Jimmy's house, and he has got this pile of junk. It really was a terrible tandem. And Jimmy lived on a hill. Okay? So we could come out of the driveway and go up, or we could come out of the driveway and go down. And I didn't want to do either one of them with that tandem. So I said, Jimmy, I'll make you a deal. Let's go out in the country where it's nice and flat out in east of Austin and ride a little bit and see how it works, see how this works out. So we did that. We, I got a rack that fit the tandem. We got out to the east of Austin, rode some of those beautiful rolling countryside out there. First day out, we rode 17 miles, and Jimmy was finished. I said, Jimmy, this looks pretty good. I think I can ride with you, but you've got to make a commitment to you. This is August. It says, your commitment is that you will ride from Houston to Austin next April. If you commit to that, I'll ride with you, but you have to buy a new bike. <laughs> Jimmy says, are you kidding me? Houston to Austin, how long is that? I said, well, you got two days to do it, Jimmy. It's only 182 miles. Come on. He finally said yes, bought a new bike, a co-motion with everything on it. I mean, it was beautiful. So we started riding together. And Jimmy rode, had a lot of people that rode with him during that time. It was interesting because typically on a tandem, how many of you ride tandems? 
typically on the tandem, who gets in the front? It's the big guy, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm fairly big, but Jimmy, Jimmy and I together with the bike was over 400 pounds. Okay, so we, it was a haul. But Jimmy was amazingly strong. So we got together and we decided to do that. And we rode a lot, and Jimmy had some other captains. He had one captain who was a young female um, army officer, probably weighed 110 pounds, and she rode with Jimmy on that tandem. And it was pretty impressive. I've ridden with other blind riders. Once I rode with Jimmy, I said, hey, can I do something else? So I rode, found some people. One was, a, was an Olympic quality blind rider. He said, how does that work? Well, he rides with Olympic quality sighted riders and they ride in the, the game. We went very, very fast. I was not his quality, believe me, but we went very, very fast. And I've ridden, as I said, with ninja legs. And then I found a man up in Minneapolis who he and his wife were both blind and both rode. And we rode tandems in Minneapolis and I missed a light. And he says, oh, don't worry about it. Just go up another block and turn left. We'll get back to this, the hill. I said, Hill? He says, yeah, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll get on and we'll, we'll make it up the hill. He knew the course so well and the town so well that he didn't have to see to know where we were. So I'm beginning to understand a little bit more about somebody, an unsighted rider. So guess what? We went down to Houston, got on the bus, went to Houston, they got the tandem down there, got on that bike in Houston, and rode to LaGrange. This was back when it used to go Houston, LaGrange, LaGrange, Austin. We got to LaGrange and Jimmy said, what does the odometer say? Jimmy can't tell. I could have lied to him, right? I said, 98 miles, Jimmy. He said, turn it around. I've come this far, we're gonna make the first, my first century. So guess what? Turn it around, head back out. Here's all the crowd coming in, right? You know, that ride in those days was starting 15,000 riders out of Memorial High. And we were going in counter to that. <laughs> so we went out about two miles because I wasn't about to come back in and say 99, Jimmy. So we turned around, came back in. We got 101 miles that first day. Jimmy's first century. And he loved it. He absolutely loved it. Riding with Jimmy taught me a lot about being aware. Because when you're riding with somebody behind you who can't see what's going on, you have to be on all the time. You know, I used to, on my bike, I'll zone out and just kind of cruise. Uh-uh, sorry. Every bump, every turn, everything that's going on, you have to talk. So one time we were riding along and I saw a dog on the side of the road and I thought, okay, that's neat, dog on the side of the road. I didn't say, hey, there's a dog up there, Jimmy. And when that dog ran out right next to Jimmy's leg and started barking, Jimmy lifted me out of my seat and almost over the handlebars. I told you he was a big guy. And when he jumped on those pedals, it just really came loose. But there were times when Jimmy would see just around the edges. And I would hurt him one day. He says, are we going by a field of blue bonnets? Oh, Jimmy, yes, we are. And it just reminded me that I need to keep talking. Jimmy is a hawk up, up to our right in the sky, and he's following us. He's just cruising along up there, and he's just so beautiful, Jimmy. He's just up there just cruising, and he knows we're here. And that's, that's the way I talk with Jimmy. One time I'm coming down a long hill. You gotta, you really gotta be on. Coming down a long hill. And Jimmy was so big that if Jimmy didn't turn, didn't lean, we didn't turn. It was that simple. You know? And so we're coming down a hill and I said, Jimmy, we gotta turn coming up. I'm, when I tell you, I want you to lean. And I heard this voice say, which way, damn it? <laughs> and so I learned a lesson. 
about how to talk with Jimmy is I had to give him all the information he needed. And Jimmy was an amazing rider. We did the MS-150 twice together. And we probably rode five, 6,000 miles together. And it was just a delight to ride with Jimmy. We were coming into Buda one day, and I don't know if you know Buda, but there's some nice little rollers coming into Buda. And we'd power up the hills and then come over the top of the hill, and we would spin down those hills and go. And it was the greatest thing. And I looked at the odometer, and we were running at 35 miles an hour. <laughs> Jimmy was a big man, and he could push that bike. And it just the joy of riding with Jimmy. If you get a chance, go talk to the school, the Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Lend your legs. Get on a tandem. Get out there and ride with those people. Ride with those kids. You'll give them a chance to do something they may never get to do again. Thank you. I have 10 copies of that, hello? <laughs> I have 10 copies of that talk in the form of booklets if anybody would be interested. Community plug. Great, great opportunity for a community plug. Um, all right, so I'm really excited to introduce you to our next storyteller. Um, her story is about growth in cycling um, and meeting someone. Um, and I, I feel like I resonate so much with uh, this story because I think I feel like I've grown so much um, in the last over 10 years um, here in Austin being a cyclist and I've gained so much like friendship and um, just had so many great experiences and grown. I don't think I would have uh, grown if I had so much, if I had lived um, in my hometown, which is deep south Texas, um, where I actually started, tried to start a bike ride um, when I didn't know that there was actually bike rides happening in other cities. Um, and it, it didn't go well because it was a very sleepy town. Um, so I'm really excited to hear more from Maggie and all of the growth that she's had throughout the years here in Austin. Give a warm welcome applause. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Val. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I guess I just wanted to start off by saying that loneliness is an epidemic in America, which is kind of a bummer to start off with, but it's so true. And I was just reading about how if you feel isolated, then your risk of getting dementia increases by 50%. And I'm a mental health professional, and that is very important to me to advocate for community. And biking has been just a huge source of community building for me a lot thanks to Val. We should all give it up for Val. She does so much for us. We all owe a lot to her. But anyway, my biking story is not very linear. It's just about, you know, my bike joy, my friendships I've made along the way and love I found. But it all starts at a pawn shop where a lot of bike stories go to die. But mine started there. I was a very poor <laughs> very poor graduate student. I was working full time. I was on the verge of my first lesbian breakup. It was brutal, <laughs> very rough, full body hives. And I really needed to reconnect with my inner child, inner joy. And I remembered loving biking as a kid. So there was a pawn shop across the street from my shitty apartment. And I walked in there, I had $30. I said, I got 30 bucks. I'm looking for a bike. He said, yeah, go in the back. There's a shed. So I went, I didn't know anything about bikes. I went to the shed and I picked based on what I knew was important, which was brakes. So I <laughs> filtered through this like pile of broken bike and I found one. It was just, now I know it was a mountain bike, um, maybe from like the 90s, it was very heavy. And I was doing this, I was like testing the brakes, you know, it seemed to stop when I needed it to break and that was good enough for me. So took it home. I never changed the tubes, never oiled it up rode that thing around for a long, long time, not knowing anything about biking. I would ride like maybe three miles, clear my head. I was in school. That was pretty much the end of that bike story. And then my friend Ryan, he lives right up the street. He told me about the Walnut Creek Trail. So we go from his house, which involves trespassing, 
and I was hooked. That was my first spark of bike joy. I was like, yeah, we gotta, we gotta go through these bamboo, you know, structures. We gotta go over railroad tracks. I'm sure many of you have taken the same route into the Walnut Creek Trail, but this is so fucking cool. So that was my first experience with like, oh, this is, this is like a really, really fun thing. It's not just for exercise, you know? And my friend Ryan, embarrassingly, he looped up my chain for the first time and I was flying, y'all. <laughs> Couldn't stop me. So I, you know, I was still in grad school. I actually got laid off. I was, I was, you know, it was during COVID. Um, my, my team got, you know, just, we all got laid off at once. And so I really was lost. I didn't know what to do. I, you know, I had been in grad school, I was working full time and I had never had so much free time. So I felt like I needed to use this time wisely. And I went to Wyoming to visit my best friend, Michelle. And while I was there, I met this hot, mysterious bartender. And this is integral to the story, I swear. <laughs> um, but I ended up just brag by saying, I hooked up with this bartender. I hope there's no children here. Um, anyway, went back to the Airstream that she lived in. And I was like, I gotta pee. Uh, we looked around, the, her mountain bike was stored in, vertically, in the uh, bathroom section of the Airstream. So, no bathroom to be had. Found myself, butt naked, outside of this Airstream, peeing, and I was like, damn, this is commitment to biking, like I've never seen before. And, I, you know, so never left Wyoming, came back, had all this free time. I was like, okay, you know, I better get into biking. Some pretty cool pe people around here to me. So, I watched some YouTube videos, it was COVID, nothing else going on, you know. Uh, watched some YouTube videos, figured out how to change my inner tube, felt like a badass. I changed my first tires, you know, new chain, I was good to go. Uh, this was also about the first time that I like experienced a group ride, and I just realized how many people were into biking in Austin, and I felt immediately a part of this really beautiful community, very supportive, and I met a couple of friends. So, one of those people, she was my coworker, Emma, and we started biking around. She was so, so fast. I was very, very slow in my shitty mountain bike, and <laughs> it was just the fight that it was looped up. So anyway, she was going fast, 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 and I was like, oh man, I really gotta get better. So I started in, you know, investing in the bike, and I went to the Yellow Bike Project, and I met Claudia, very, very, uh, you know, just a wonderful person, and she's very inspiring to me, and she talked about bike packing, group rides, all these things that I really didn't know so much about. She introduced me to them. Um, and around that same time, I also met a couple of other people that I that I biked with. It's an integral part of my now, my life. Aud my friend Audrey, she uh, hooked me up with my, my road bike, and I am so much faster now than I was on that old mountain bike, y'all. Uh, but anyway, where am I now in the story? So, I have this group of friends that I'm biking with. I'm going probably about 20 miles on some weekends. We're getting beers, we're having a great time, learning how to fix my bike, uh, you know, just, just casual. And then the hot, mysterious bartender from Wyoming, she comes back into the picture. It turns out she moved to San Antonio. And she doesn't have, I guess, too much going on here. She's in school, she doesn't really know many people around. And so I'm like, yeah, oh. Come on up, we have so much fun. We go biking every weekend. It's a great group of you know gay people. You're gonna fit right in. And so she comes up, she doesn't know what to expect. I'm terrible at um, I guess preparing people for what is to come. So she comes and we're like, yeah, you know, we'll bike maybe. Bring your bike. So she brings her bike. We end up biking longer than I had ever biked up to that point. But I wasn't about to say this was too much for me. I was gonna go for it. So 40 miles later, one bottle of water between us, my shitty mountain bike, we survived. There was a point in time where I did think I'm going to have a stroke, but I did not, and I'm here to tell the tale. So that was wonderful. I realized what a gem she was, and I needed an excuse to have her keep coming back up from San Antonio. So I was like, you know, what's going on? My friends and I, we've talked about doing this uh, bike race, the Marfa 100. I had, you know, up to that point, not biked that far. We did the 40 miles that one day, it was a fluke. But uh, I was like, yeah, we're doing this, guys. Didn't you know, I texted my friends, hey, sign up. We're going to between the Marfa 100, let's start training. So I texted her, I was like, yeah, you know, come back up next weekend, we're gonna do this group ride, we're gonna train every weekend. <laughs> so it was my ploy. 
I really didn't care that much about it. I was in it for the beer previously. Now there's romance on the line. I <laughs> kind of stepped up. So I did. Uh, I don't know how many weekends in a row y'all think that she came up, but it was going on like. 14 weekends in a row. Wow. <laughs> it was lovely. And you know, at the time I was like, wow, she's really into Viking. And of course she was into me too, but I was too shy to really make that move. So anyway, we did. We trained for the Marfa 100. We did the Marfa 100 with Izzy here, who is here tonight. And that's, you know, and we get another friendship I made from biking. It was truly lovely just getting to know her through biking. It was very casual. You know, you can meet so many beautiful people um, biking. So, anyway, circle back. We did the Marf 100 with Claudia, Izzy, Audrey did it. You know, we did it with all the group of people that I had mentioned before biking. We come back, life is settled in, it's official now. Uh, life life kind of goes on. So, what, what now? You know, so we go on some more casual bike rides. Then Emma and I, we start getting a little closer, biking, you know, with Hannah and everybody. And we're thinking, like, guys, why don't we just uh, keep doing this all the way? Let's maybe do some communal living. You know, we kind of joked about let's start the commune like everybody does. I know uh, we've talked about that a lot. But anyway, it came to fruition. One day, Hannah, Emma, and I, we were at Pine House Pizza. And we were talking about how awesome it would be to communally live together. Eight days later, we signed on a duplex in South Austin. And now we all get to bike together as often as we can. And it's so beautiful. I think that's all I have to say about my love for biking. coming up, and I'm very excited to say her name, Pathosaurus. Um, I know that they're a big part of the Hill Country Ride for AIDS, and I'm sure they're going to have an amazing story for you. I've had the pleasure of doing that ride for the past couple of years, and it's truly one of the most amazing weekends. We all camp and just have a wonderful time, drink beer, have a beautiful ride. Um, this most recent one was actually a really exciting milestone for me, because I was able to complete my 10th century of the year for it with a number of people, some of whom are, are here. Hi, Jack. Um, and it was just a beautiful, wonderful adventure. So, Kathosaurus, I'm very excited to have you come up. Join the charity bike ride without actually owning a bike. <laughs> True story. I am not making any of this shit up. So in 2017, I had just come home from burying yet another person to AIDS, and I was not bouncing back like I did when I was in my 20s in San Francisco when we were burying people left and right. Um, so I was like, my cracks were showing. I wasn't getting the kids to school on time. I wasn't getting to work on time. Lunches weren't getting made. Shoes weren't getting tied. I was a fucking mess. So after many, many nights of sitting by myself, crying in my living room by myself till dawn, I opened up my laptop and I was like, all right, 2017 Austin AIDS, click. Hill Country Ride for AIDS, click. Oh my gosh, I haven't missed it. It starts in six weeks, click. <laughs> Oh my gosh, it's the last night to get one of those cute little bike shirts with the zipper and the pockets in the back. I've always wanted one of those. Click, click, done, shut the laptop, go to bed. Feeling really proud of myself. Woke up in the morning, holy shit, I just signed up for a bike ride and I don't own a bike. I mean, I have a bike, it's like a Playa Burning Man beach cruiser with like the back pedals, but like no like real gears or, or like brakes or just like anything. So I was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta call this people and tell them that I'm not doing this because 
uh, not all decisions that you make at 2 o'clock in the morning are good ones. So I called the, the number at the bottom of the website and I'm like, hi, dude. Um, I don't have a bike. I don't know why I did this. Like, donate my shirt. I'm super good. Thank you so much. And I got the ride director at the time, Prentice, and he is made of magic. And within 10 minutes of talking to him, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to find a bike and I'm going to, like, make a team and I'm going to like ride a gajillion miles and I'm going to raise a million dollars. <laughs> and so it was at that point that I had to tell my husband that I had signed up for a bike ride without a bike. <laughs> but he was not surprised because he's been with me a long time. Um, so I was able to find a bike um, through a mom at my kid's school. She gave me a bike and a rack. And so I was like, okay, here I am. I'm going to go to this joy ride. Um, it's, this guy says it's somewhere in the, at the Vela Way, which I'm pretty sure is in North San Antonio. And I drove out there and, oh, I went to the store. I bought some padded pussy spandex shorts because I was pretty sure I needed to have some of those. And if you pour your fat ass into those, that's commitment. Like, you're ready. You're going to do the ride because you're doing that, and, and that's it. So I show up. Um, some lovely gentleman like pulls my bike off the car. I'm like, all right, I meet all these fantastic people. Everyone's so kind. We go for this ride. I'm like, okay, I can do this. We did like three laps around the Bellaway, which is like 12 miles and change. And I'm standing in the parking lot. Like, I wasn't sure if I was holding the bike up or the bike was holding me up. But regardless, we were both standing vertical. And I'm like, okay, I can do this. This is fantastic are so nice and that's when they said oh yeah well so that was just the warm-up and now we're gonna go do 30 more miles um are you ready and I was like fuck you <laughs> hell no I'm not doing that but I was like I was trying to be so cool and so I was like oh yeah no oh yeah look at the side oh yeah the kids and the stuff and the junk and the things and yeah I gotta go okay yeah have a nice time you fucking sadists <laughs> and so I was like peace out yeah bye and they left and then it was at that point that I realized I didn't know how to get the bike back on the rack. <laughs> because I had been really concerned about what I was wearing and what I was going to be flagging, meeting all these brand new people. And my beautiful husband had put the bike on the car for me. And then some lovely, handsome young man had taken it off when I got to the Bellaway. So I didn't know what I was going to do. And I couldn't call my husband because then he would have been like, girl, serious. You're not doing this shit. And I really wanted to, so I was like, okay. So I picked up the bike and I put it on the spiky things and then I just started strapping down anything that was hanging off. Cause like, honestly, I didn't know what else to do. And then there were these freakishly long black nylon threads for days. And I was like, well, fuck this. And so I just braided them and then I wrapped them around the bike like as many times as I could. And then I totally white knuckled it to Lowe's and I bought like a bucket of bungees and then I just like went crazy with all the bungees because I was like, this should get me home, right? So like, that's how I got started. Um, I, I went to school to a drop off with the kids and this mom comes up to me and she's like, oh, hey, like check out your rack. And I like looked at her and I was like, well, yeah, you know, like I nursed two babies off them and like I don't just tuck them into my belt now, but like, thanks? Like, so weird. And she's like, no, your bike rack. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm a biker. And she's like, really? I was like, so I told her I was going to do this race and I was like super excited. And she's like, oh, great. They told you about the butter, right? And I was like, yeah, for my toast. And she's like, no, like, like the butter, the, the, the butter. And that's all she, she was just like, and I was like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, they totally told me about that. Cool, thanks so much. And I was like, the fuck is this thing talking about? <laughs> so I go to the internet, biker butter, do not do this. Don't even do it, even if you want to think you might want to do it. It's nowhere you want to go. So I went and I looked and I looked, and I don't want to jack this up. I got to like, hold on. Okay, okay, okay. So this is what I found uh, of the biker butters, not the other stuff. You know. um, chamois butt er, D's nuts, 
D's Nuts Bliss, which is for those of us that have, I guess, our nuts on the inside. It's for the ladies. Um, blue Steel. Squirrels Nut Butter. And then my personal fave right here, God bless the marketing on these people, Hoo-Ha Ride Glide. <laughs> I am not making this up. Like, this is legit. So, um, <laughs> I have this mic and I'm going to do a little PSA here. Um, cyclists, bikers, own your kink. Why you got to blame the Europeans? Because you want to take some mentholated spicy lube and like rub it all up in your like business. Like if that's your jam, own that. You don't got to blame it on them. I'm just saying, don't, don't give your shame to them. Own that. Own your kink. Okay, end of PSA. Back to my story. So, um, so I finally figure out the the. Well, I, I didn't really figure out the bike rack. Like, I'm an electrical engineer. Like, I, I know science shit. Like, it's my thing. It's what's in my core. I got this right. As far as I was concerned, like Black Magic was keeping that right. The rack on the car. Like, honest to goodness, I I truly don't know how it does it but it does it, it's magic. I'm just gonna leave it at that. I'm sure you guys all understand the magic as well. So I get to ride day and I show up and I've been raised in a gay household. So I know how to do fucking pride. Like I've been in pride parades in multiple states, multiple countries. Like I showed up ready to do some pride. Oh my gosh. Well, y'all are just a little more subtle than I am. So I showed up with a helmet that I made, because, hello. And then I also showed up with a tail that I made, because, hello, every Cathosaurus needs a tail. This is my special rainbow one. So this is what I wore, which I showed up to the Hill Country Ride for AIDS. No one knew what to do with me. They're like, who is this bitch? She cried. And so, but that was fine. You know, like, I didn't realize, like, pride to them was, like, a rainbow flag on their socks. And they're like, woo! And I was like, right. Yes. Like, I purposefully didn't show up with, like, the suppositories that fart glitter. Because I was like, mm, it's a borrowed bike. I probably shouldn't do that. But, like, I get it now. I get it, I get it. So I start the ride and I'm like, this is fantastic. I'm singing show tunes to myself. All the pit stops have like drag queens and dance parties and like super good snacks. And I was like, yeah, I can do this. Even though it has hill country in the name, like I got this, I'm doing it. Well, so one of my friends I met at the halfway point my first year, oh, God bless him. He likes to remind me, remember when I met you and you thought you were this really hot mess, but really you were just lukewarm? And I was just like, bitch, <laughs> don't make fun of me because I was riding. So I finally get to pit stop six, I think it was, and I see this like lineup of bikes and I was like, oh, that's where we're supposed to park our bikes. I got this. So I went and parked my bike there and I did the kickstand, turned around. Y'all know what happened, I don't even have to tell you, right? I totally Pee Wee Herman that shit. Like, every single bike went down in the whole entire fucking row. And then I was like, oh, and I, I, I didn't know what to say. I was like, oh my gosh, I am so sorry. Like, let me help you. And it was like this angry lesbians, and they were just like, ha, just go. And I was like, no, but really, I'm so sorry. Like, uh, let me, and they were just like, go. And I, I know that you probably think it's very easy to, you know, hide at a pit stop when you have like a two foot long dinosaur tail, but it's not as easy as you think. And so like I got my peanut butter and jelly and I was like, dude, I gotta get out of here before these ladies like do some ritualistic, like, like I don't even know to the bike gods and like sacrifice me, like I gotta get out of here. And if any of you folks are those people, like I am so, so like, oh my god. And I'm sorry for calling you angry lesbians. Um, so I finally finished the ride. I'm super psyched. I, I, I ended up being the number one fundraiser for a new rider. 
which was kind of cool. I had a lot of, I have a lot of uncles, um, gay uncles. And yeah, so it, it was fantastic. And I did it and I'm super glad. Um, it really is a fantastic ride. If you'd like to join us, please do. I see so many faces out here that they would love to tell you um, all about it and their bike story. I actually ride with my kids now, which is super awesome. Um, yeah, it really is. It's, it's so fantastic to be out on the road riding with them. Like, I can't even tell you, it's, it's magical. Even with all the whining, there's in mine. You know, like, I'm telling you, it's fantastic. My eight-year-old did the ride this year for the first time, which was great. Um, I, I forgot, oh, look at her, there she is, she's so sweet. Um, so yes, please come and join us. We're a really great organization. It is a ride, not a race. Um, and again, just thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, thanks. Thank you so much, Kathosaurus. Give it up one more time. Oh my goodness. All right, y'all. We are about to go into intermission, but before we do, let's have a little fun and hand out some raffle prizes. Yeah. Thank you so much for your donation. Seriously, it really makes this event possible um, and continue to be sustainable. I've got big, big goals um, for this little project little big project of mine um, that I've tackled on, tackled, <laughs> taken on. Um, so I, seriously, I can't thank you enough. I can't see your faces. It's, it's now a bit dark, but um, I really, truly am looking at all of you. Sincerely, thank you so much. Um, I wish you could all win. We have wonderful prizes. Um, you're all winners in my heart, trust me. Okay, these are my lovely assistants here who are holding some wonderful prizes. I, it's been hard not to get them to, <laughs> to keep them and their little paws off of them, but uh, they are going to hand them out. Okay. Just phone down. All right. <laughs> Bob's Pickle Pops. Thank you, Bob's Pickle Pops. <laughs> okay. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Drum roll. Good luck to everyone. All right. So they have three prizes. These two, which have amazing water bottles and things from REI, and I believe some shirts from SRAM, and some Bob Pickle Pops. Um, and then we have another prize, which is a um, four-person pass to an Austin Mosaic Workshop um, on Cesar Chavez with our friend Jay Muzak. If you haven't met him, he's back in the back. Um, he knows all things art and graffiti here in Austin. Amazing, amazing member of our community. So let me give that prize out first. <laughs> Keep these these cuties up here for a minute. All right, the winner. Zach, I should have had you like pull it up. I'll do this. Okay, the winner is Ivana. No last name. Ivana? Are you still here? Yay, Ivana! Um, yeah, if you want to come up, up, or Jay is in the back, if you want to meet up with Jay, he has your four, pa four person pass. Um, to the Mosaic Workshop. Yay. Thank you again. Okay. Come on. I feel so honored to pull the winners. Okay. Eric C. A E R I K C. Eric. Eric C. Eric C. Are you here? We'll give you a few minutes. We'll call another person. Eric C. Hmm. Okay. Bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> we'll wait. We'll wait a few minutes. We'll wait till the end of intermission. We'll see. All right. Next, next person is Badis. What? Oh! <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, Zach hey, Badis. True nice winner in our community. We love you, Zach. We're so happy for you. You need all of the bike things. Whoop whoop. Eric C. Erica Carlson. Erica, are you still here? Yay! Okay, there was a tiny A. I see it now. <laughs> I wrote this, so I'm so sorry. Thank you to 
lovely Cinda back here who has been checking folks in. Cinda is also with Cyclist Law. By the way, thank you to Cyclist Law, one of our yearly donors, our only yearly donor, um, making this event possible. All right, that's it for the prizes. Um, you are dismissed. Uh, we're gonna put on some tunes. Y'all are free to mix and mingle. If you haven't yet, please go get your bevy. There's a few left in the cooler back there. Um, there's also a convenience store that has lots of cool things too. If you haven't had a chance to hit the swag table, there's more stickers and fun things there. Um, come back, there's a restroom over here. Come back in about 10 minutes, okay? Have more stories for y'all to listen to. My name is uh, Andy Eleanor. Uh, you might know me from events such as Wet Hot American Bummer Volumes 1, 2, and 3. Uh, you might do a fourth volume in November, but uh, enough, enough about me. I want to have the honor of introducing your next speaker, Patrick Crowley, who uh, has a bicycle-powered mobile library uh, for the, those without a fixed address, which is awesome. I had a chance to speak with Patrick before this whole thing all started. Um, in addition to talking about the Mobile Library is going to talk a little bit about, uh, or at least as he mentioned, life, the universe, and everything. I was like, well, do you at least know the answer? And of course, we both know the answer, since we're fans of Douglas Adams. Uh, many of you hopefully also know the answer. But uh, he's going to come up and talk about, a little bit about that, as well as uh, the Mobile Library, uh, powered by bikes. Give it up for uh, Patrick Crowley. I've done this before. I'm going to do it like Jimmy Morrison right now. I'm going to start this off. I hate things that start out and they just don't connect. I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story about something that happened to me in San Francisco, California. Yeah, I was in San Francisco, California in the 70s, I must confess. I was there during the start of the AIDS crisis, and that's no lie. And I knew work with people who are starting to be affected by it. And I did not leave San Francisco until the mayor and then one city council person were shot. And a bunch of people went to a place. The Central American drank some Kool-Aid. You know, at that time, we didn't know anything about acquired immune deficiency syndrome. But I moved. I moved to the Midwest. Moved to the Midwest. I was an entertainer. I was an actor. I can project. And yes, I was in a production of Glen Gary, Glen Ross by David Mamet. I play Roma. Roma begins to play with a man named Levine, who he's selling land to. Levine was played by a fellow named Jerry Humber. We rehearsed for about four weeks. And then Jerry quit coming. And finally, the director told us that Jerry had pneumonia. And Jerry died of AIDS. You know, back then, everybody that got AIDS died. And I know from back then that things that people didn't understand, they shunned. And they avoided, and they made up stories about why that happened, because it wasn't them. And that's just part of my story. But I came here as part of a disappointment. You know, I was here, I was originally moving to this town, and I interviewed across the country, and I was going to open a, a business for somebody here and make some, make some cheddar. And as it happened, I sold my house in Seattle, I was ready to move, packing stuff up, and they say, it's an HR. I said, what is it? They're like, oh, the, all the paperwork's in process. The house is sold and packed and ready to go, and the guy says, 
I don't know where everything is, and it turned out they had a hiring tree. But I moved here anyway, because I'm an optimist. They said, well, the hiring freeze is going to be over, and everything will be fine. Everything will be fine. So I had to finally call them months later, and they go, well, it turns out we don't want to do that thing in Austin anymore. We're going to do it in Atlanta. So I'm here to tell you, fuck Atlanta. That's kind of my opinion. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, at a, I'm at a crossroads, like a lot of people, like a lot of people that were in San Francisco that were trying to, to be one person and, and had to hide what they were with other people. And I grew up poor, and I grew up around addicts, and I grew up around criminals. So I know about marginalized people. And as I thought about it, I finally figured, like, why would I go back to working for the kind of people who fuck me? And then I had this idea. I was in Portland, Oregon, where the bike films were made, 2015. I saw a cart, a public cart, people with blankets, sleeping bags, and their possessions trailing behind them, go into this cart to get books. That was the first time I heard about Portland Street Books, run by a woman named Laura Moore. And I got this crazy idea. I said, you know, that might be a good idea for here. I saw Steve Adler, and Steve said, oh, that's a great thing. And I saw a bunch of people said, that's a great thing. But nobody came up with anything to So I met with Laura at a National Book Foundation conference in Astoria, New York, in 2016, where there were drag queen story queens. And like I say, it was all about, Jason Reynolds talked about why reading matters. And I knew from my own personal life, when I was on the streets of San Francisco, and I'm not talking about the show, Having a book when I was out during the day after a cold night where I could lean up against the warm concrete and I could read something transported me to a place. It was like when I was a little kid and I grew up in the projects, I could go to a library and I was in a whole different space, a safe space, a space that I thought belonged to me. So I came up with this crazy, Lord, I told, I'm going to do it. And I went to a bunch of people, and if you ever seen Team America, this is where you have to do the montage part. So sing montage to yourself. Gonna be a montage! Because this is where it is, because I'm looking into where to get bikes. I'm on the internet. I go to a yellow bike. They got nothing for me. I go to see a guy that owns a bike shop downtown. He says, I fucking hate that people. Don't come here. I went to a lot of different places. And I finally found a company in Denton, Texas, that had bikes that were for people that had children. And I, I was on a limited budget. Is this all out of pocket? I said, hey, could you sell me just the frame? So that's what I did. I bought the frame from what was then Urban Tribe Cargo Cycles in Denton, Texas. My friend Aaron, who's now Bunch Bikes. And then I found a woodworker. I started to try to do it myself. I found plywood. I thought, I had no plans. I went to Portland and I said, how'd you make that? So said, well, my brother-in-law, Lord told me my brother-in-law is an architect. And he just cobbled something. He's got a wood shop. And so basically, she had no plans at all. So all I had was a picture. So I went with the picture, started trying to do it myself. I found a friend that knew a woodworker, and then I got a custom cargo box that would accommodate books. And I have a friend in the Midwest that does murals. And I got a hold of him, and I said, hey, I got an idea for this thing. And I've got a design concept, and I said, could you do that? Can you do an armadillo? And we went through like six or seven versions of armadillos, and we found just the right one that he made on the bike, an armadillo handing out books. That's what Austin Street Books looked like. Because Portland wanted to make it different than Portland. So I started out, I've been doing this for about six years now. Very low budget. It is a registered nonprofit. Much like a lot of my patrons, I gotta tell you, don't get a lot of love. That's okay. Because I know people that when I'm on the point in time count with the mayor or whoever, 
people know me. Because I'm somebody that comes through and I'm a friend. I'm somebody that has a magazine, or a comic book, or a book, or maybe even just a story. It's like this tonight. It's all about stories. And that's what I ask people. And they go, well, can I get you something to read? And they go, I don't know. And you'll give me one off, and I go, well, tell me, what kind of stories do you like? Tell me about the stories, and then I can always tell them about an author that writes those kind of stories. Well, try this. And yes, the books don't all come back. It's a lending library, but you know what? It is one of the best things that I've ever done. I don't accept a lot of praise for it. People think it's the greatest thing since Toast, and I think the last one. You can think whatever you want to think. I'm not really a nice guy. I'll tell you that right up front. I'm a bit of a shyster. I'm a recovering drug addict. Yeah, don't trust me, man. Like I say, if you got money lying out here, I'd kind of keep it close. <laughs> but I will be at the Texas Book Festival and have been for several years if you want to see the bus. And uh, I am downtown on every Wednesday, sometimes Saturday down there in the, the farm. I go down where the people are. We expanded services this year with the Homeless Outreach Services team. And I'll probably be taking books in a backpack into the woods so that I can get more access to more people because the bike just can't physically get in. I wish they could. I want to leave you with one more story. As I was in Philadelphia before I even got this thing kicked and running, and I was in a church basement. And it was November. It was cold. It was really cold. There were guys outside that were trying to split fifths of vodka. Tell they were freezing to death. We were down having a little men's meeting in this church basement. There were guys who would come in because we had free coffee and donuts. And this guy that came down there with a sleeping bag wrapped around him. And you could tell he was cold. And he was eating donuts and looking at us because he expected us to crack on him any minute. Because that was the life he was leaving. Before he left, he screamed, We are not homeless! walked out the door. That struck like an arrow right in my heart. The people that lived here long before this land was taken from them moved from place to place. And they created their home wherever they were. It's only our minds that build that prison for people. So please, if you can think of street books and you're, you're thinking of outreach, a member of the Out, uh, Association of Books and Beyond Outreach Services, a member of the Texas Library Association, we receive no funding whatsoever from the city, it's just the way they are. I'll close with a poem, because I'm classically trained. <laughs> For those who are familiar, because transformative resilience is what this is all about, I will recite Invictus. Out of the night that covers me, Black is the pit from pole to pole. I thank whatever gods to be for my uncomfortable soul. In this fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head, though bloody, still on bow. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Thank you so much for your time. Is Mike working now? Give it up for Patrick. Here for the stories and the meaningful work the people behind them are doing. Um, this next speaker has a story that people called bullshit. They said, that's ridiculous. There's no way that's true. So, you know, we all have those kind of stories. I'll leave you with one teeny one before I introduce our next speaker, Bradley. Uh, I've got a story that many people think is bullshit, but is entirely true. Once upon a time, I was on a cross-country bicycle tour. I was a thousand miles away from home in a city where I knew nobody. 
and my bike got stolen. I know. But I sought the help of the local bicycle community, and miraculously, somehow, some random good Samaritan on the street recovered my stolen bicycle and returned it to me mere hours later. But wait, there's more. Four months later, come to find out this complete and total random Good Samaritan stranger in a town a thousand miles away from home where I knew nobody was actually my blood fourth cousin that I never knew I had. So that's my true bullshit story. And uh, Bradley's going to come up here and tell you one of his. For the, thanks, thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, I'm Brad or Bradley. Thanks, uh, Valerie, for in, in inviting me to, to tell a story. Um, yeah, I guess some of my friends know me as a storyteller. Um, and this is one usually I say, like, oh, no, you, you've got to make several more cocktails before I tell that story. But um, it's not actually, uh, like, my story's not bullshit. The, the story is about a bunch of bullshit I thought I was hearing. Um, yeah, so warning, the word uh, bullshit will be used. Um, so uh, this was like 2004, no, 2005, maybe 2006. I was living in Scottsdale, Arizona. And, um, you know, I was like 24, I think. Uh, I was in great shape. I just stopped playing baseball. I was riding a, a cyclocross bike at the time. I would ride from home all the way down to campus, then to work, then over a mountain to where my friend had a gym, and then home. And it came to about 73 miles a day is what I was riding, all on roads. There was no off-roading. Um, I was just in, I was in great shape. Anyway, I, I was running this little house. Uh, I was running this little house with an ex um, in Scottsdale, and it was right next to one of these like runoff ditches where you know a bunch of water uh, accumulates uh, uh, basically you know any of the ten times a day that they try to create Ireland in the middle of the desert there um, and I had these two corgis and so of course you know you take them into the little park and you throw the ball around well this very distinguished gentleman I met before long uh, he always had a polo shirt on which had a coat of arms on the polo shirt. Now, like, I didn't realize this was being live streamed, so I had already sort of made some redactions in my head, you know, because I don't know what he told me in confidence and everything. And now it's being live streamed, like, okay, like, there's some keywords here. I'm sure you could type in and find out who this is, whatever. Anyway, so, all right, so, you know, I'm, hi, I'm, you know, I'm Brad or Bradley, you know, and he, goes, he goes, oh, you know, it, think about when you meet someone, okay, there's a particular genre of communication upon meeting someone for the first time. You don't expect them to say, Oh, you know, I don't. Uh, I won't require you to bow to me. Uh, however, when I when I play golf with Prince Charles, uh, technically I'm part of a uh, uh, the the level of royalty that I am in the Scottish house is of such a higher status than Prince Charles that you know I always remind him when we play golf that he's supposed to be bowing to me, uh, which he really just ignores, and then we play you know, and then we just continue. But he should be bowing. To I was like, who is this guy, you know? Who is this guy who's like, this is how I meet him, you know? I'm just going to call him Ron. I'm going to try to keep calling him Ron. Okay, anyway. Um, you know, so I'm, my God, you know, uh, I, I'm an ethnographer uh, for a living, and so I like to hear people talk. And, uh, you know, he's there with his dog. Um, you know, so over the course of several months, uh, actually, probably over a year, you know, I get to know this guy, um, Ron. And, um, well, what else about Ron? Well, Ron uh, was the C is the CEO of the second largest mining company in the world. Um, I guess just to tie everything in together, he discovered AIDS. It was in his mine in the middle of Africa that suddenly his workers were, were dropping dead, and so he sent... Um, he sent his personal physicians from Scotland down to find out why people were dying and they discovered the virus. He has since created, he said, seven AIDS vaccines and one 99 cent oral AIDS test. Don't ask me where they are, okay? Um, when he was 18, he went all around the world uh, in his Land Rover 
Um, and he uh, decided that Switzerland was his favorite country. And so he eventually became a citizen there. He's from Canada. Um, uh, anyway, okay. So, I mean, every time I meet this guy in the park, he would just, you know, whatever was going, I'm telling you, I forgot 90% of the things this guy told me. Um, you know, he would, you know, who he got off the phone with, oh, you wouldn't believe what we're dealing with and this, it's like, oh my God, you know, anyway. Um, oh, uh, his wife is the third star of TriStar Entertainment. She uh, wrote Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Um, even his dog is famous. His dog rescued 80 people's lives in the Alps, uh, in the avalanches, because, you know, he lived in Switzerland, right? So, okay, I mean, this is just, you know, each, each tail was taller than the other, you know, and I would bite my lip, and, it, you know, sometimes I would test him, and I would say, like, um, well, hey, uh, uh, Ron, Ron, why, uh, uh, you know, why are you renting uh, a house in this little neighborhood, you know, if you're the, the CEO of the second largest mining company in the world, why are you renting a house uh, in this, but he always had a plausible explanation for things, every time, so, you know, he, you know, he'd say, well, would you invest in one of these paper houses, structures here, you know? In Switzerland, the smallest piece of wood we can use is a 12 by 12. You know, these last generations, you know, this is just made of paper. Um, it's like, well, you know, it's actually kind of true, you know? Um, you know eventually, I looked him up online. Um, I discovered a uh, super janky website. I think I could say janky, right? Yeah. And, um, uh, which was basically a bunch of stories he had told me. Um, with, you know, it looked like, uh, it, you know, it wasn't, you know, very sophisticated. Um, I did come across some quotes from him in the New York Times, but really, you know, it didn't seem like anybody had vetted whether or not this guy was real. It was just a sort of, you know, it would just say, like, self-described, you know, CEO of whatever, and he would have something to say in a, in a quote or two. So, you know, I was super, you know, obviously, I just like, all right, well, I'm going to let this guy talk, um, and I'm just going to go along for the ride. Whatever, it's free entertainment. Well, uh, like I said, I was riding a lot those days, working out a lot. I was in great shape. Well, one day we're working, we're, we're, we're our dogs are, you know, whatever, in the park. And I don't know how it came up, but, um, uh, uh, but uh, you know, there's this mountain uh, nearby, Thompson Peak. Is that the picture? Did you? Yeah? Okay. So, you know, just now to tell the story, I looked it up, and um, the, the peak's like 2,500 feet, okay? Um, anyway, you know, I don't know. If we were just like, talking, and I, you know, I ended, you know, I pointed to the whatever he was. He says to me, "Oh yeah, you know, I write up that almost every day," and I just could not keep it in at this point. And I just, I, I just, it just belted out. I was like, "Bullshit! There is no." This guy's 75 years old. Okay, I'm 24. I look at this mountain, and I'm like, "There is no way in hell I could bike up this mountain." Um, I mean, I just, I just could I was laughing in his face, you know, and, but, you know, he just straight face, you know, always dignified. Um, and um, he says, oh, yeah, yeah, I, 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 he says, you want to go tomorrow? I said, yes, 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 I, I do want to go tomorrow. Let's do it. Let's go tomorrow. And he says, well, yeah, okay, well, actually, two days, because I got a, uh, you know, important Zoom call tomorrow, or whatever, we didn't have Zoom back then, whatever, Skype. And um, he says, uh, I said, okay, day after, he said, that's right. Can I pick you up at 8 with the car? We'll put the bikes on. We'll go. Absolutely. Let's do it. Let's go. So, uh, so you know, again, this is, you know, Valley of Hell. Uh, it's a, over 110 degrees. Um, so, uh, you know, we load the bikes up early morning. And he's, you know, he's already going. This guy's already talking. You know, oh, I just got off the phone that day. I'll never forget. That day he had just gotten off the phone that morning with the ex-CEO of ExxonMobil, and they were complaining about the new CEO of ExxonMobil and how he's allowing China to recolonize Africa and just just going on and on and on. And, it, you know, it was never information that you can't get off of the news, really. You know, it was just... Some of us think we have a good bullshit detector. Mine was just always just, you know, alarms, you know, blazing with this guy all the time. And, you know, I said, like, you know, this is it. I'm going to really show this guy. I mean, there's no way this 75-year-old guy, right? So we get, we park at a trail, which is way off of this picture. And there's a long incline off-road to get to the base of this mountain. Uh, you know, and he had mentioned, uh, he had mentioned to me, you know, when he lived in Switzerland, they weave back and forth. You know, they, they, they when he, he goes up these mountains, they, they go back and forth. They weave. They don't just go straight. They weave. 
anyway, you know, we, we get the bikes off and we start riding, and he just talk. He's just talking, talking, talking. This guy's just, you know, you ever, you know, I, you know, I've been trained by several people how to identify bags of hot air, and like, you know, <laughs> this was one of them, you know. But he just keeps talking, keeps talking, and um, anyway, you know, it's about 45 minutes into this gradual incline off road to get to the base of the mountain. We're not at the base of the mountain yet. And, um, you know, I just noticed that, like, oh, wow, this is a workout, you know. But I also noticed that this guy's still talking. He's not, he, it's like, does this man breathe, you know? And, and, I, and I, you know, I remember squinting to see, like, is there any sweat? And he's, he's just talking, you know. There's no sweat on this guy whatsoever. He's just talking about this and about that. And I was like, well, you know, wait a second, like, what? This, this, is, this is weird. I must have eaten something wrong or whatever. And we're like 45 minutes and we went for another 15 minutes and it was getting steeper, but we still weren't at the base of this of this mountain, Thompson Peak. Um, and uh, at a certain point, I just said, okay, like, I, I just want to get some water, you know, but honestly, I was out of breath. I was out of breath. And he, did, he, he, and he stopped the bike, no shame, and he just kept talking. This guy just kept talking. He was, just was, wouldn't shut up, you know, he just kept going. And, you know, and then I just look at the mountain, and I'm like, oh, my God. Like, this, you know, you know, and I, I said, this is the mountain that you ride up? And he goes, yeah, yeah, you know, but it's, it's not so bad. You just got to weave. So I tried. Then we started going again, and I was like, all right, I got to study the way this guy's weaving, you know. <laughs> so, I, you know, I start, you know, he's weaving back and forth, just talking, real casual. And so I start to do it, but then I realized, like, this takes actually a little bit of skill also, you know, to, to weave properly without flipping over on the roots or whatever. So I'm like, I can't do this. I just got to hit it straight. Anyway, we go for another 15 minutes, and, and this guy still, I cannot find a bead of sweat on his forehead or anywhere, and he's riding in regular clothes. And I said, you know, I said, Ron, I, I, I go, and, and I just stopped, you know, in awe. And, and I'm thinking of all these bullshit stories he told me. And I knew that, like, this was the biggest of them all. <laughs> and I'm looking at him, he goes, you all right? And I go, you know, and somehow between my, you know, deep breaths, I, I mentioned, you know, yes, I'm, I'm all right. And I said, I, I'm ready to go back. And we never even hit the mountain. And he was like, okay, no problem. And we turned around and we kept, he talked the whole way back, you know, and I, the whole way back, I'm just thinking to myself, like, oh my God, like, what are the implications of this? Like, this guy is, this, everything he told me is true. This is unbelievable. Like. I can't believe that, like, I mean, this, I mean, really, it wasn't, I mean, I didn't see him climb the mountain, but I'm telling you, this guy was so formidable, there was no way that, uh, that he did not uh, climb this mountain every day. Anyway, um, you know, that was this guy, and, you know, every once in a while, I shoot him an email just to, like, you know, because I start to doubt whether or not he actually existed, and so I email him, and, or I text him, and the last time I contacted him a few years ago, he, you know, he replies, you know, I just, hey, I, you know, how's it going? You know, he replies with a 10-page response. And, you know, he's in, he's in talks with now with the CEO. This is a couple years ago. He's in talks with the CEO of uh, Boeing. He's bringing back Zeppelins, you know. He's bringing back. And, again, you're like, and, you, know, run, you know, come on. You know, what, what are you talking about? How are you bringing back Zeppelins? He's, and then he always has a plausible explanation. He goes, you know, it's the most efficient way to bring heavy mining equipment into the middle of Africa. And you're like, well, goddamn, it really would be the most efficient way to bring mining equipment in the middle of Africa. Anyway, so yeah, that's just my uh, that's my story about about Ron, and I hope you liked it. That's all. Bikes are amazing. People who ride bikes are amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Preston. Preston's amazing. Um, I have more prizes to give, and maybe you all have more opportunities since a few people have left. So thank you for coming and staying for the second half of Bike Story Night. And just FYI, Bradley was the last featured storyteller. So give a round of applause for all the featured storytellers. <laughs> Takes a lot to come up here, to commit to this time, and share your story. Um, has anyone ever thought about sharing a story? Raise your hand. 1, 15, 25, great, great, this is great. Um, I love that, and I hope you share a story at the next Bike Story Night. Um, 
we have two wild card storytellers. Wild card storytellers, again, don't have as much time as featured storytellers. They don't get to show photos. So I don't know, we'll just kind of leave this lovely uh, graphic up here. Just a reminder, these are our amazing partners, sponsors. Thank you again to them. By the way, I'll just go ahead and call out a couple more prizes. Good luck to you all. Zach has already won for the night. Unless he has I multiple, think, think, think multiple? Okay, okay. sorry. Okay, first prize goes to Melissa H. Melissa H, yay! You are here. Um, actually, sorry, Melissa. Actually, the table, Eddie has your prize. Eddie. Wave, Eddie. <laughs> we do have a wild card coming up, so get ready. Uh, Corey B. Corey B. <laughs> C O R E Y, Corey. Corey. <laughs> oh. Corey. Uh, should we just go ahead and skip it? Bye, Corey. Sorry, Corey. All right, Chloe Le Chapelle. Are you still here? I hope I said your name right. Le Chapelle. Le Chapelle. La Chapelle. It was really cool when I met her. It took me a minute to spell this, but uh, out. But um, Chloe, Chloe, Chloe. Okay, sorry, Chloe. Chloe has gone for the evening. Instead, we have Lily Friend. Lily Friend, gone. Okay. Brenda M. There's probably like six Brendas here right now. <laughs> if you know, you know. Brenda M? No? Oh my gosh, what? Carly V, another. Carly V? Really? Okay, we're, I'm gonna save all of these. I'll take a photo of all the, all the people who left. Andy's coming up to tell me something, I feel like. Carly is here! Oh, for Carly. Andy's here Carly. for Carly! Yeah, Carly! Oh, Carly. Carly. Uh, Eddie has your prize over over yonder. I was told to get it for Carly. Okay, Carly. fabulous. I'm glad. Carly. See, this is what you do. You have friends who back you up, get your prizes. Okay, we got Carly. Okay. I think Andy's just like... Um, so we have more prizes. Please stick around after the wild card. The, ne the last prizes are like kind of the best prizes, so you should stay. Just saying. Um, <laughs> what? Okay. Uh, let's give it up for our next wild card storyteller. This person submitted their wild card submission in advance, which is great. What you do? Uh, her name is Ray, and uh, <laughs> Ray, get ready. Uh, a little bit about Ray. I love bikes and my dog. The synopsis of Ray's story is, I learned how to fix a flat tire after a very bad day. So let's see how this goes. Ray! 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 Thank you. Um, thank you, Valerie. And what a wonderful night of storytelling. And what a wonderful night of storytelling. Yeah! Um, and what a wonderful night of of hearing about what bike, what people are doing with bikes for our community. Um, and this is not a story about that. Uh, I did not learn how to, I didn't take driver's ed when I was a kid. I did not learn how to drive a car until I was 21, actually. So on my sweet 16, my parents took me to Bike World in San Antonio. And they said, pick out anything you want. And I found the most beautiful Gary Fisher three-speed city cruiser, is what they called it. And I loved it. Um, and then shortly thereafter, my parents kicked me out of the house. And they told me to pack a bag. And I remember biking away with my backpack and my Gary Fisher, not really knowing what was going on. Um, I was homeless for a little while, which was not easy, 
but I started figuring things out. Uh, got a room with some friends and just really didn't know anything at all, um, but thought I did. And uh, after a little while, my parents were like, all right, we have some stuff for you. You can go pick it up at this counselor's office. The counselor's office was so very far away. Uh, it felt impossible at the time. It, I didn't have a smartphone, um, and I remember looking up the directions on like my roommate's laptop and just having no idea how to do it. And then I remembered the bus. I had never taken the bus before, and I had never put a bicycle on the bus before. Um, and thank God for that bus driver, because they taught me everything. Uh, and I remember I go to the counselor's office and you know, don't even take anything because I didn't have any way to take it home because I was on my bicycle. And I was waiting for the bus. And I don't know if y'all are familiar with the Via buses in around 2007, but they were not very reliable. And I waited for so long and then I remembered I have my bike. I can just go home. And uh, I get a flat tire somewhere in North San Antonio, no idea where I am, no idea what to do, and I call my dad crying, and I'm just crying, and I'm asking, I need help, I can't do this. I've tried my very, very best, uh, and I, I just don't know what to do. So after a while, he comes and he shows up, and I'm like, oh, great, my dad's going to save the day, he's going to drive me home, it's all going to be over, and he brings out a patch can. And there on that side of the road, I learned how to fix a, fix a flat tire, and that is where I learned that I can go anywhere. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, how many of you know how to fix a flat tire? What? Oh my goodness, that's amazing. Uh, how many of you know how to do a wheelie? Hell no. <laughs> okay, couple, couple there. Um, this is a question I like to ask. It's a stupid question, but how many of you have more than five bikes? Okay, nerds. <laughs> Thank you again to Ray for sharing your story. Said my last minute there. That was a really fun one. Um, thank you again to all of the storytellers. Um, we've got one more wild card, and then we have community plugs. Does anyone have a community plug? Do you remember what community plugs are? They are 30 seconds to plug any event, thing, ride, um, business, anything you want. Um, so FYI, after Brenda, start scooting this way, and you can come up for 30 seconds and grab the mic and say what you want to share with this community because you want them to hang out with you and stuff. Um, so I'm really excited to announce this next wildcard speaker. Uh, her name is Brenda Chuliwa. A uh, little bit about Brenda. Owned bicycle shop, avid cyclist, lover of fun. <laughs> um, a story synopsis, title three bikers in a porta potty. I'm just gonna say that. <laughs> <laughs> Come on up, Brenda. <laughs> also, more prizes after this. Okay. Thank you. Okay, hang on. I want to turn this way. Turn this way. Hang on. I I need I need notes because I'm I'm old. Speaking of old, all you old ones. Okay. So the title of this is Three Bikers in a Porta Potty. So, oh yeah, I need the mic. Where is it? <laughs> I'm pretty loud. Okay. I have to be careful not to be too loud. Okay. How many of you have ever been caught in a storm on a bike ride? Yes. Yeah, yeah right, right, right. On the Thursday night social cycling ride, we've had some doozies, haven't we? I don't know if y'all have been on them. Lightning, pouring rain. It's scary and it's fun at the same time. People pay a bunch of money to go to Six Flags. And as a cyclist, we get this real thrills for free, right? Right? 
right? <laughs> Nothing? All right. So I've always said that biking is better than a ride at Six Flags, right? As a bike shop owner for 20 years, I have heard some stories from my customers, a lot of good stories. Most memorable, one of the most memorable, but wish I could forget, is one that Kat reminded me of. She left now. I was going to call on her. From Bob, a 63-year-old 63 year old veteran who gave me a vivid detailed rendition of his Noxzema application to his scrotum. So those kind of stories, you know, <laughs> you hear. But the one I'm giving tonight is from my friend Tom. And he told of a time that he got caught in a storm on an organized ride. And this was in the early 80s when all the small towns decided to put on rides to raise funds for their firefighters, etc., It was the Weatherford Peach Pedal and had about 200 riders. Since, this, since then, this ride has grown and become a really big ride. I don't know if it's still going on now. But on this ride, Tom was riding 60 miles solo. And at about mile 50, the weather turned bad. It was rainy and windy. And he came to a rest stop that had been abandoned by the volunteers and all that was left, all the volunteers were gone. All that was left was a porta potty. <laughs> As he got to the stop, there were two other guys stopped there. And the rain became vicious. Then it started hailing. And they all three rushed into the porta potty for protection from the hail. There was a silence as they huddled in the small, smelly box, shaking. The, the wind was shaking the potty and the sound of hail pounding them was deafening. Imagine a bubble to read above their heads as to what they were silently thinking. Tom, my friend, he's thinking, darn, I was looking forward to the snacks at the rest stop as his stomach growled with hunger. The second guy, well, this is a shitty way to die. Yeah. <laughs> Third guy, oh, I gotta pee. <laughs> After a long five minutes, the hail stopped and the rain slowed and they decided to leave their strange, stinky shelter. They got on their bikes and rode off together and they became friends and rode many rides after this memorable experience bonding experience. It's a bonding experience. And you know what? That's what bicycling does. It brings us together, doesn't it? I mean, I look out here and I see the people I've known now for 15 years. Many, many people. We've all met because of cycling. Right? Yeah. Woo! I love y'all. Huh? I've known you 25 years. That's right. Cycling's what brought me here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but wait, there's more. Um, that does conclude the storytelling portion of the evening. Thank you again to all the storytellers. Don't leave without saying goodbye to me because I have something for you. Um, and thank you again to the wild card storytellers. Thank you to Lee for lending us this beautiful space. Really appreciate you. Thank you to this amazing weather. Um, all right, so we have, I'll just go ahead and give this one out because I keep feeling like I'm gonna forget it. Um, we have a $50 gift card to um, Central Machine Works, which is just around the corner there. They have amazing beer and pizza. There, we go there often on our Sunday cruise rides. I know a lot of y'all join us, so I hope that you win <laughs> this, because um, I know we've been there multiple times. So I'm really happy that they donated this. Okay. Oh my gosh, I hope the, the people are here. <gasps> James North? North? Nordy? James N O I did not write this. James N O R T I. James? No James is here? James left. James. Sorry, James. Wow, there's actually a lot. Okay, just Rick. Yeah. 
Frick! Frick! Okay. <laughs> Lee B. Lee B. Leo? L E E H B. <laughs> okay, Annie S. A N N E S. Where did you go? Didn't you know there's prizes? Russ, Russ Garcia. That's a friend of mine. I'm so glad. I think this was his first bike story night. How many of y'all, this is your first bike story night? Oh my gosh! Awesome! Yes! How many, this is your 10th bike story night. <laughs> this is the 10th bike story night! Okay. Uh -uh -uh. <laughs> Nate K. Nate. Congratulations, you are the lucky winner. And your little dog, too. This is Oscar, everyone. Oscar, you're such a good luck charm. Congratulations. Okay, we have more cool prizes. Um, REI water bottle, Bob's Pickle Pops, some t-shirts from Shram, some other cool stuff. Um, and we also have an extra special prize in a second. Jay's gonna come up and tell you more about that. I'm gonna tell you too. Garrett Hall, Hall, sorry. Garrett Hall. No? Oh, okay. Did he tell you to? I don't know if he told you to. Doesn't sound like he did. Eddie. A Addie Smith? Uh, Addie Smith? Yeah. Yeah. yeah! Is that how you say it? Addie? Uh, Addie. Yeah, I don't know. All right. <laughs> awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. I'd love to get a photo with you and your prize before you leave. Okay. okay. Congratulations. Okay. Our next prize is an amazing prize. Um, Jay Music. If you have not uh, met, oh, come over here. Jay uh, before, you should totally meet him. He's amazing, he's in our cycling community more and more now. He um, is an amazing artist and recently um, helped the Austin Viking community build a, an amazing mosaic work uh, project that's on the corner of 18th and San Antonio. Um, a lot of you probably contributed to that project. Um, so he has this amazing book. Please tell us about your book, Jay, and then we'll draw a name. Thank you, Val. Well, when Valerie said, I need raffle prizes, I was like, hell yeah, bike yeah. community gotta stick together. Uh, so this is a book I put together uh, called ATX Urban Art. Uh, I've been an artist in Austin for 20 years, and it's really just a kind of a product of that. It's the layers of graffiti, street art, murals, and mosaics of our city. Uh, it's $85 value, limited first edition. Uh, we're quickly running out of copies, so um, so yeah, I thought this would be a cool one, and you could do your own little bike mural tour uh, after reading the book. Oh, yeah. uh, Hannah P. Hannah P. In the house. Yay! 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 Amazing. Congrats. Thank you. Did you sign it? Okay, I think we have two more prizes. Uh, they're back. Oh my goodness. All right, you know her. You love her. She's everywhere, in your dreams, on your bike rides. Who am I talking about? <laughs> no, Karina! <laughs> the most fashionable cyclist in Austin. Congratulations. Your prize is on the back table. I'll give it to you in a second. Brenda, Chuliwa, you're so sweet. Okay, one more. Oh, Jason A. Another amazing community member. Meet me and Karina in the back in a few minutes. We, we can also just like hang out. Um, I think that that is it for all of the prizes. Um, if, oh, community plugs. I knew I was forgetting something. Whoop. Okay, let's go, community plugs. Come on, who's coming? Get up here. Get up here, line up. 30 seconds, community plugs. Bring it in, bring it in, bring it in. Hey, who's first? 
Um, yeah, you're first. Okay, get ready. 30 seconds. Where's my timer? I got it. Give me 45 seconds. <laughs> Give her 37 seconds, no more. Okay, so tomorrow is Star Wars Day. Bum, bum, bum. Central Machine Works has a really fun thing going on until 8 o'clock, from 6 to 8. But I ride with Social Cycling Austin, and I'm leaving you on Thursday Social Ride tomorrow. Thursday night Social Ride tomorrow. Chill ride. I haven't made the route because I'm gonna make it tomorrow or tonight when I get home. But we're gonna do a mid stop and it's a flight saver, aka bike jousting tomorrow. Ooh. So show up in your Star Wars outfits. Woo -woo -woo. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. Who's may next? The be with you. May the fourth be with you. It's officially Star Wars Day tomorrow. I'm not gonna lie. And then after that, it's Cinco de Mayo. So. Come up, because I'm going to keep talking. Woo! Sakurai! Ah. Woo! Alright, uh, starting now. Okay, uh, on, there is currently an election going on, if y'all don't already know about it. There are going to be two things in the election, Prop A and Prop B. They both have the almost the exact same language, except for the, the organization behind it. Uh, Prop A is by Equity Action, a long saying organization that is trying to bring greater accountability to the police Woo! and oversight. Yeah. Uh, Prop B is, uh, says they are the same, says has the same exact language on it, uh, but they are a, is run by a front group for the Austin Police Association. This is not a conspiracy theory; it's well documented facts. Um, they they literally spent a hundred thousand dollars to to get a petition on the ballot that looked the exact same. Three hundred thousand dollars to get a. Uh, to get a ballot on the proposition, lied to the voters, said that they were an organization, uh, basically that they were equity action. Um, the ele election, early voting is already over. Uh, your last day to vote is May 6th. May 6th from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, so this, this Saturday, thank you. Uh, there will be a ride uh, run by Spokesy folks if you go to their Instagram page that starts from, from Hyde Park, Quax, uh, I think 11 a.m. Um, get your ass to the ballot. Uh, raise your hand if you voted. If you've already voted, you are now deputized to get everyone who has not voted to the polls. Yeah. Go! Woo! Yeah. Yeah. Woo! Yes, on A, no on B. Yes, on A, no on B. Hi, this is like the third time you guys have seen me. Oh, wait, yeah, so what? Yes, on A, no on B. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, on A, no on B. Um, I said this last time for the last Bike Story Night I came to, which is just that there's a small group of us that get together for Bike Story Night. Not Bike Story Night. Austin Bicycle Meals. Just in front of, I'm in front of the banner, so. uh, For Austin Bicycle Meals, 4.30 on Saturdays, we just uh, bring a bag, bring a basket, and we'll, uh, Food Not Bombs makes a lot of meals that they have, a, they have a distribution problem. We solve the distribution problem by putting all the meals in our baskets and then taking them out to the unhoused uh, uh, in East Austin. Yeah. We also need people to help prepare the meals and bring the meals to the start spot of the ride. You can reach out to them on their Instagram. Um, it's an amazing group of folks. You should totally do that. Um, we have one more third. Okay, can you put? Okay, Ooh. get back there. What's up, y'all? Me, back again. Uh, I work for Specialized Austin, and we are covering all race entry fees for women and women identifying riders at the Driveway Series for the next six weeks. So if you want to get into road criterium racing, it is the largest weekly attended criterium race series in the nation, and it's on an actual race course right down the street just off Southern Walnut Creek Trail. If you've never been, go by and spectate. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we're also going to be at the Austin Cargo Bike Festival on the 13th, so if you want to commute, you're interested in e-bikes, you want to get a cargo bike, a bunch of different bike shops and brands that are going to be there, come check out some cool cargo bikes. And then I also lead a uh, first of the month mountain bike ride from our domain showroom. We're going to go ride over Walnut Creek Metropolitan Park. So first Saturday every month, 8.30, we do donuts and coffee, 9, we are wheels down. So that was my little plug. <laughs> Thank you, community plugs. Y'all, give it up for yourselves. Give it up for this bike community in Austin. Seriously, it's the best. Right? We're rocking it out. Um, I just want to plug um, 
I am hosting a fundraiser for Bike Story Night, June 10th. It's a Saturday at Independence Brewery. We are collaborating with Film by Bike. We're showing eight short bike films that are all amazing. You semi-saw the trailer. Um, please consider going or donating and continuing to help Bike Story Night grow and be bigger and better each time. I can't thank you enough for bringing all of your amazing energy, all your amazing stories, all our amazing friends over here to make this event really what it is. I, this is a dream come true. I am like so, so happy and thankful. Um, I hope that it continues for many more years. I also want to thank Jordan one more time. Give it up for Jordan. He is an amazing rock star. Give it up for Deborah who helped with the slides here. Megan helped with the time. Cinda's left. Marissa's taken over. Thank you to all the volunteers today, flyering, helping with other kinds of bike story night things. I really hope that you come to the fundraiser, reach out, ask me any questions. Um, thank you so Sunday much. Three. I know Jordan wants to say something. Sunday crew. <laughs> uh, please come to Sunday Cruise. Happens every Sunday. Jordan and I are the leaders, organizers for almost seven years now. So please come chill with us on a bike soon. One more. Anyone want to bike back to Central Machine Works with Maggie and hang out maybe, or just, you know, get your car or whatever. Um, she will be biking, leaving in about five minutes or so. So please be ready to rock and roll on that. Anyone else have anything to say? We good? Everyone? Yes? Yay! Thank you again.